and welcome to High School Physics Explained and today I would like to see how well you know Newton's laws. So this is my next video on how well you know. So as with any of these videos, the best thing is to go through the question, pause the video, try the question yourself and then I will go through the answer with you. So the first question says a bullet bounces off a metal can and during the collision the bullet exerts a force on the can causing it to move. At the same time the can exerts a force on the bullet causing it to slow down and change direction. Which of these following statements best describes the relationship between the magnitudes of these forces? Is it A the force of the bullet on the can is larger than the force of the can on the bullet? Is it B the force of the bullet on the can is smaller than the force of the can on the bullet? Is it C, the force of the bullet on the can is equal to the force of the can on the bullet? Or finally, is the relationship between the two forces depends on the angle of impact? So in this case, this is a clear example of Newton's third law. And Newton's third law says if object A applies a force on object B, then object B applies an equal but opposite force back on A. And the answer, of course, that is always the case. So in this situation, since F A on B equals F B on A, then the only possible answer is C. Where people often get confused is the idea is that objects that are lighter or heavier will obviously respond differently. But they don't respond differently because of the forces, because Newton's third law says that the forces that they, they experience is the same. But what actually is different about the two objects is how they accelerate. And that touches on Newton's second law. Here's our second question. When two objects R and S collide head on, they exert forces on each other. The force that R exerts on S is F R on S and the force that S exerts on R is F S on R. If the objects are identical and their speeds are identical, the statement there is true. Now, if R is heavier and faster than S and they collide at an angle, then what is the case in these cases? Is one greater than the other? Is one lesser than the other? Are they the same? Or more information is required to work out how the forces are related to each other. Now, if you understood the first question, and I again stated that Newton's third law is true always, regardless of the mass or the, the conditions of the objects, then the only possible answer again is this, that the forces are equal in magnitude but in opposite direction. And that's what this negative symbol is all about. Now let's have a look at the next question. In this case, we have an object of mass 5 kilograms and it's experiencing two forces, one towards the east and one towards the south. One is 3 newtons, one is 4 newtons, and you have to work out the resultant acceleration. I'll give you a moment to try it out. Now when you look at this question, you can clearly see that this object is experiencing two forces. And so this question is all about Newton's second law. And Newton's second law simply states this, that the acceleration is dependent on two things. It's dependent on the net force acting on the object, and it's dependent on the mass of the object. In this case, we are given already the mass of five kilograms. But what we haven't worked out yet is the net force. It's experiencing two forces and we need to work out the net force. So in order to add those two forces together, you need to do a vector diagram. And the first thing, of course, is we have a force going towards the south of four newtons. But then we have to add a vector horizontally, in this case, towards the east of three newtons. Therefore, the sum total of these two forces is a vector that is in that direction. Now, doing the mathematics, it's pretty clear using Pythagoras that this value, magnitude-wise, is equal to 5 newtons. So there is our net force in terms of magnitude. But force, of course, is a vector quantity, so we need the angle as well. So this angle here can be calculated out using trigonometry. And if you work it out, you can see that if you have the tan inverse of 3 over 4, you get the angle of approximately 37 degrees. So this is the 37 degrees, though if you wanted to work out that angle there, you can see that is the complement of that, and that of course is equal to 53 degrees. So 
Having that worked out, we know the angle that the acceleration will go at, but we need the actual net acceleration. And to work that out, we need to know the mass, of course, and which we already know. Since the force, of course, is equal to five newtons, and the mass is also equal to five, in this case, five kilograms, you can see that the acceleration ends up being one meters per second squared. So now looking at the answers, you can clearly see A and D have one meters per second squared. The direction, of course, is this angle here. And if you want to know the angle, this angle here is either 37 degrees towards the east of south, or it is actually 53 degrees south from the east. So if you look at this, it says, is it directed at 53 degrees south of east? In that case, the answer is D. Here's another question that involves Newton's second law. And here again, we've got four forces acting and we have to work out the magnitude of the acceleration. I'll give you a moment to try it. Well, this is relatively simple in the fact that these forces are either in the vertical or in the horizontal. And the point is, is that we can treat them separately. So in order to work out the total sum forces, these two forces cancel out. So therefore there is absolutely no acceleration in the vertical because they're actually equal, but in opposite directions. So the total net force is only resultant due to the 10 Newton force going towards the right and the five Newton force going to the left. And so therefore it's pretty clear that the net force is simply equal to five Newtons towards the right. Of course, the mass is already given and the mass is 2.5 kilograms. And so therefore our acceleration is F over M, which is equal to five over 2.5, giving us an acceleration of two meters per second squared. The answer is A. Next question. A rocket car moves on a straight horizontal track Half of the initial mass of the rocket car is a propellant. During the run, the propellant is consumed at a constant rate and ejected at a constant nozzle velocity. Which of the following best describes the force propelling the rocket car and the magnitude of the acceleration of the rocket car while the propellant is being ejected? All right, so let's have a look at the question. So we've got a rocket car and here is my very basic rocket car and we have propellant going out the back like so. Now the point is, is that this fact that the velocity of the propellant is constant and it's been consumed at a constant rate, what that means is, is that the force on the car is equal to the force on the gas, that's Newton's third law, but that this force is a constant force. It's not changing at all. So therefore, the force on the car is actually constant. So that automatically means A is a possibility and C is a possibility. However, the thing is, is that the mass of the actual car is decreasing because it is getting lighter all the time due to the fact that it is losing fuel. And so what we have is we have a mass that is decreasing. Now, if the force is constant and the mass is decreasing because of Newton's second law, if this has to remain constant, then by having mass decreasing, acceleration must be increasing. So that leaves basically the only possible answer, C. A mass is attached to the length of string and is moving in a circular path around a central point, O, on a flat horizontal frictionless table. And here it is in the diagram. The string breaks as the mass passes the point X. Which line best depicts the subsequent path of the mass? I'll give you a moment to work it out. Now this all involves the concept of centripetal forces. And the centripetal force is a force that is always applied towards the center of the circle. In other words, this object has a tendency of wanting to go in that direction, but it's changing direction all the time due to the fact that there is a force pulling it in towards the center. That is the whole nature 
of centripetal force. And so, for example, if the string was actually out here, the object is currently moving in that direction. But the fact that there is a force in this direction, which we refer to as the centripetal force, it then, of course, changes direction. And from here on, in, it is now going in that direction. And from here on, it's going in that direction. So as a result of this centripetal force always being applied, the object will continue to move in a circular path. That is the only force acting in this situation. And so therefore, if this string were to break, the force that is pulling this into a circle is no longer there, which means the object will continue to do what it's doing. That is Newton's first law. And so therefore, the only possible answer is B. Now, A is not correct because the centripetal force needs to be constantly at play. We've already established that that's not possible. C is a ridiculous answer. There's no reason why it would react in the opposite direction. One common misconception is that the D may be a situation, and it is incorrect, make it absolutely clear. And that is the belief that, that there is some sort of force, some sort of force being exerted on X in that direction. Now, the fact is, of course, is there is the reaction force due, placed on X x basically if this was a circular motion but the fact is that this force is is not actually an existent force this force only is there as a reaction due to the centripetal force okay so in, in other words this force is not a real force and therefore it has to be discounted two masses are joined by a string and are pulled along a horizontal frictionless surface as shown in the diagram and you have to work out the tension i'll give you a moment to try it well, again, this is an application of Newton's second law. And the best way to start this is to understand that this two kilogram block and three kilogram block as a single system of five kilogram. And this whole five kilogram block must be accelerating because the only force acting on this particular system here is this 20 Newton force. We've discounted any frictional forces being applied in the opposite direction. And so therefore, the acceleration of the system is simply equal to the force being exerted, which is 20 newtons, divided by the mass, which is a combined total of five kilograms. And so therefore, the combined acceleration is four meters per second squared. Now that we've treated this as a whole system, and of course, this mass and this mass are both accelerating at four meters per second squared, which is clearly the case, then what is this tension? Now, the understanding of this is that this two kilogram mass is only experiencing a force due to this string, which has a certain tension. Now, that is actually the same value as this tension that this three kilogram force is going in the opposite direction. But for simplicity, we only have to really deal with that component because this T is exactly the same. And so therefore, the acceleration of our two kilogram block is equal to this tension divided by its mass. But we already established the acceleration as four meters per second. And so therefore, the tension is equal to the mass, which is two kilograms, multiplied by the acceleration, which we already established was four meters per second squared. And so therefore, we get a grand total of eight newtons. B is our answer. A little bit more difficult question here. Two frictionless tro trolleys are pulled apart so that an elastic band connected between them is stretched. Trolley one has a mass of three times greater than the mass of trolley two. Position X is the midpoint between the separation between the trolleys. And you have to ask, okay, where are they most likely to collide? Is it position W, X, Y, or Z? I'll give you a moment to work it out. So the first thing to understand is, of course, that trolley one has a mass of 3m, where trolley two has a mass of 1m. So therefore, we're clearly making the distinction that trolley one, trolley one is three times as heavy as trolley two. Now, when they let go, they're both going towards each other. And the forces are exactly the same. That is Newton's third law. Now, the fact that this, this trolley is lighter you would understand that its acceleration will definitely be higher than trolley one. And so the idea is clearly that 
this guy is going to move in a much greater distance than this guy over here. And so therefore, Z and Y are definitely excluded. Is it possible that it's X or is it possible it's W? But can we show this mathematically? And we can. And the way to understand this is to understand the formula that R is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. We're interested in the distances when do they undergo acceleration. And so we can ignore UT because they're both starting from zero. So what we can say now is that R is equal to a half AT squared. So now let's have a look at the two situations. Now, before we go on, we need to understand the acceleration. We know that because the fact that the forces are the same, the acceleration of trolley number one is going to be different to the acceleration of trolley number two. And that is because of Newton's second law. So for trolley number two, the acceleration number two we're going to be three times greater than the acceleration of trolley number one. So mathematically, we can write down this, that the acceleration of trolley number two is going to be equal to 3a, whereas the acceleration of trolley number one is only going to be 1a. And that is simply because they're both experiencing the same force, that is Newton's third law, but because trolley number one is three times heavier, its acceleration will be three times lower than trolley number two. And that's how we've got it written over here. So now let's go back to our displacement. So our displacement of trolley number one is equal to a half multiplied by a multiplied by t squared. For trolley number two, its displacement is a half multiplied by the acceleration, which is equal to three a multiplied by t squared. Now the thing is, is that when they collide, the times are the same. And so what we can now do is rearrange this. So what we have here is for trolley number one, we have t squared is equal to 2r1 over a. But of course, for trolley number two, the t squared is equal to 2r2 over 3a. Now the fact is that these two are equal. So what we can say now is 2r1 over a is equal to 2r2 over 3a. Now you can clearly see that the two can cancel out here and here. The accelerations can cancel out here and here. And now you can see that r1 is equal to r2 over 3. In other words, the displacement here is going to of r1 is a third of r2. Okay, so in other words, this car is going to move only for one distance, this guy is going to move it one to one to three. And so there's that one. And there's the three, because you can see that r2 is bigger and therefore they have to collide at W, and therefore the answer is A. I hope you found that video useful. And remember, like, share, and subscribe. Oh, and if you have a comment or a question, or you'd like a concept for me to explain to you, please drop a comment down below. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.